Good morning, parents everywhere, and welcome to the very first edition of Parents Canada Talk Radio. My name is Jason Thompson, and I am here with my co-host, Lisa Durante. And we are here to help everyone navigate through the minefield of what it takes to be a parent. We're going to be here every single week from 11 to 12, and we're going to talk about all sorts of great topics that we hear from parents that are really important. Whether you've got a newborn, you've got a teenager, you want to talk about social media, you want to talk about sleep, that is one episode that I am absolutely looking forward to. Our sponsors are our, our leaders for all of this, Parents Canada Magazine, available at parentscanada.com. Great information, trusted journalism, mm-hmm. and a place really where, as parents, we can actually look at and say, oh, you know what, there's some great articles here, some great things to be able to learn from. And we we actually drew from that for today's very first show. I guess since it's our first show, you know, yeah. it'd be really important to talk about who we are and what credibility exactly. we bring as parents. We're not just two people that they just picked up off the street. So, <laughs> Lisa, let's start with you. You're a mom. You've got two wonderful daughters. Yeah. Tell us about tell us about what it is that, uh, that you do as a parent. Yeah, so I do have two daughters, nine and seven. Um, and, you know, I, I approach parenting as I had a pediatrician with my very first daughter who said that every day your kids are taking a step towards independence. And so that is my job is to prepare them for that day. Um, And so it's all about how can I teach them today so that they will be ready for tomorrow. Um, You know, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. I'm going to be learning along with, you know, everyone who's listening here. um, And that's why we're going to bring in the experts to kind of hear from them um, so that we can all learn. And how how is your parenting morning going so far today? Oh, most mornings are 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 not good. Um, they're they're a challenge, um, and I, I think that's true for a lot of working parents. You just need to get out the door. But kids kind of have their own schedule, um, and they don't want to leave. They don't want to wake up. They don't wake up in a good mood. Um, and then the other one, you know, has some sensitivity issues and wants to cry on your shoulder, and so you have to peel them off when you get to school. Yeah, it's fine. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of parents out there. There went, yep, checklist. I hear that. I feel that. That sort of thing. I'm as, I, I got my uh, grade eight daughter off to her grade eight grad trip today. Oh, big, that's so big much fun. smile. And, uh, you know, as a parent, as, as a parent, I, I live alone in, in my house as I'm thinking, oh, great. I have like a, a whole night to myself. And of course, you know, I'm almost 50 now. So the idea is like, I have a whole night where I can catch up on work and sleep. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's fantastic. So me, my name's Jason and, mm-hmm. and my situation's a little bit more complicated. I, I always love to say that I, I manage between three and and six kids. So I have three biological kids, but in truth, uh, my partner and I, we live in two separate households, but I I do get the great honor of managing all six kids at times. And because of that, it it, it definitely makes scheduling kind kind of interesting. The big thing for me as a parent, especially knowing that my days are can be crazy, right? Like, I don't know if I've got one kid or six kids kind of in the house at any given time is, is I had to look at, at parenting from a bit of a different perspective. And, and I take a bit of what I to call a metacognitive perspective, a wider perspective. Ooh. People are so tactical with their parenting. It's, you know, we're talking about social media today. And so it's immediately let's, let's fix this thing or let's put this restriction on. And I try and take a broader perspective like you. I, I love that idea of looking at my kids at the age of 20, you know, they're going to have a decision to make. And that mm-hmm. decision is, you know, what is it what I want to do going forward? And my, what I tell my kids is uh, my goal is to make it possible for you to be able to go out there and make that decision as opposed to having that decision decision for you, made for you. Mm -hmm. And so the goal then becomes, how do you work backwards from that? And for me, a big thing is, is looking at my kids' behavioral approaches to things. So my son, who just got into Waterloo, I just wanted to get on the radio just to say that my son Congratulations. That's awesome. (laughs) He did that on raw raw talent, right? Good good scholar from that perspective. But the truth is, when he gets into first year next year, he has has an issue with motivation, getting tests, getting uh, assignments in on time, things like that. And so I'm really trying to work with him to get there. And knowing that the outcome is when he's 22, 23, he's going to have to make a decision. And having that motivation is a really, really powerful thing to go for. So there's my mm-hmm. approach to parenting and how that can all work. And again, like you, don't have the answers, don't have any of the answers. And I'm really hopeful that we can make a difference overall. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so today, like you just said, we're going to be talking about social media and parenting in the age of social media. It's... It's a whole new world. Um, I didn't grow up with it. Uh, I assume you didn't grow up with it. (laughs) Um, I think I'm older than you. Yes. (laughs) 
fine. <laughs> Um, and so it is. It is about how can we we actually raise our kids, you know, to to be safe online, but also to leverage the positives that come out of it. Um, and so we'll be talking to Paul Davis later on. Um, before we get to that, you know, one of the ways that we wanted to open the show was to look at some of the things that are happening in parenting mm. right now and say, okay, what what can we learn from this? And of course. The story is a couple of weeks old, but I think it's an important one to start with, which is this whole college bribery scandal yeah. that we see Hollywood celebrities dealing with right yeah. now. And and I, I got to be honest with you, I had to look it up on Wikipedia because I'd heard <laughs> I'd heard some periphery stuff, but I hadn't really paid attention. It, it was interesting. So the college bribery scandal, if you don't know, it is is some parents have paid a recruiter to go out and and fake test scores and pave the way for their kids to get into good colleges in the United States, yeah, in the right? US, yeah. And so all of us moral parents are right now, as soon as you hear that, you're like enraged. This is terrible. This is yeah. some some sort of awful thing. But the truth is, is I was listening and I was reading about this scandal that has kind of ensnared some people who are, are going to go to prison for a while. I just kept a thinking of a good long while, long while, up to 20 years, I think, for, for some of them. And some of them have plea bargained out already. But mm -hmm. as I was as I was looking at this, I was thinking about French immersion. And I was thinking about, you know, as parents, we are constantly trying to find any edge for our kids to get into the right school or the right place going forward. You know, I, I know parents who have fudged addresses so that they, mm -hmm. their kids can go to school in one place or or French immersion. You know, we see French immersion. And I think there's a, an article in uh, the Globe and Mail from a couple of weeks ago that talk about uh, people who use French immersion as kind of like a proxy private school yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So we're, we're consistently looking for ways that we can help our kids get forward. So I look at the scandal and I think, OK, I get it. I mean, morally, that's they're definitely in the wrong place. But truly, the mindset behind this is the mindset that a lot of parents seem to have. What do you think about all that? Exactly. Uh, when I first heard it, uh, you know, I, I was watching, you know, uh, e talk, and that, that's that's one of my favorite shows in the evenings. Um, and so I, I was at first, I was I was a little shocked, um, and then I was like, oh, nice that you have this much money that you could that you could really do something for your kids. But then the truth is we pave the way, or at least I do pave the way for, or clear the path for my kids all the time. I'm always trying to think ahead. How can I make this easier for them? You know, they call uh, the Gen Z parents, uh, which I am a Gen Z parent, um, the lawn, the, is it the mower parent? The uh, mower parent. Yeah. Yeah. That you kind of mow down every obstacle that is in the way. Um, and so it was just a little bit of a wake up call because I, I, I understand and I appreciate what they were trying to do. They went too far. They crossed a line. I know I go too far. I, I've never crossed the line that way uh, legally, but I do go too far that I don't. Um, I don't allow my kids to learn or to, to have to be resilient in any way to overcome a hurdle on their own. So it was just more um, like a, a little wake up call for myself to say, OK, you know, I have a nine year old. She has to start figuring things out on her own. And it's OK if she falls down, she'll pick up her, herself and. We were talking off air about a podcast I recently listened to called The Knowledge Project, which is all about mental models. I love, love this podcast. And there was a, an addition on parenting. And they talk about parental coaching, about the ability to, you know, let your kids fail in context for, you know, so that they can they, they can understand. It's, it's much easier rather than lecturing your kids to actually have them face real world consequences or, or it's, sorry, it's easier to get them to face the real world consequences than, than lecturing at them. Mm -hmm. now, I find that, that to be an interesting thing, but, you know, somebody reminded me off air that that's great in theory, but how many parents, when the, when the rubber hits the road, will take that risk to allow their kids to fail a test if they've forgotten a book at school and they can't study and things like that? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've actually that, that's been something that since the scandal that I, because it was a wake up call for me that I've, I've, you know, my daughter had a math test a couple of weeks ago and I was not going to sit with her and study. I was like, she's nine. She's in the fourth grade. She's got to figure this out. Um, so did not remind her. And sure, she had a whole week to study and she only studied, I think it was maybe two days. Um, but on the second last day, she was in her room studying and I was like, oh, thank God, because <laughs> I think I would have at that point stepped in. Um, but I, I let it go that long and she did end up studying. She didn't do as great as she would have had she studied for the full week, um, which is then was a lesson. Well, had you studied a few more days, maybe you could have done better. Um, but I, I did, you know, I felt like that was a little win for myself that you know, I was able to stick to it. It's a standoff, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. it's that. How far will you go until you 
until you blink. You know, do you have to threaten? And that, that's a, a thing with me is how do you get away from negative-based parenting, right? Threatening mm-hmm. to shut off the Wi-Fi or take away the phone or anything along mm-hmm. those lines. How can you use positive reinforcement? I mean, in my career, that's what I do. You know, I, I, as a recognition professional in part of my career, I teach people that using thank you can affect behaviors in positive ways. But at home, you know, under the gun, it doesn't always work out that way, does it? Yeah, no, it, it takes a lot of... Um, it, it, it takes just a lot of courage, but then it's it's kind of like, you know, you sitting in front of a bowl of chips and you just want to eat the darn chips. And how much um, willpower do you have to actually not do it? Because, um, you know, you can't just have one. <laughs> um, so I really want I, chips now. <laughs> either you have the whole bowl or you totally stick to your willpower and not not have one at all. One of the ways that I found that I can do that is to not actually put myself in that situation in the first place. If you've got kind of the bigger the bigger thinking approach to things. Yeah. You, you don't tend to react to every single situation. The kid forgot their shoes when you're heading to tap class. You know what? It's okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. They can go to tap class. They can do it in their socks. Yeah. And you're yeah. not going to have the other parents sitting there looking at you like you're the worst parent in the history of all time. In fact, now that I'm thinking about this out loud, I would love to do an entire episode on parental judgment because mm. that's what we do. We fear the judgment. And we have the judgment, don't we? Right? We we do. We do. Listen, I'll, I'll, I'll say it straight up. I'm sitting in waiting rooms at doctor's offices or in extracurricular activities, and I am absolutely judging you. I'm not meaning to, but it just is part of the human condition is, is how could they let that child do that or that sort of thing. So if yeah. you send your child without tap shoes, I'm judging you for that. And when I send for it without tap shoes, you're judging me for that. And that's okay. It's okay. It's just kind of the, the thing. We just need to be able to get along and that sort of stuff. I'm looking at you right now, Lisa. Well, you're well, looking at I'm like, just not that. I don't think I'm that evolved as a human to not react <laughs> every single time because um, things are always forgotten things are always missing and I do react the, you know one time. of the ways that I get around that because you know, <laughs> during the winter it's always the gloves and the hats and the scarves. Oh. so my strategy I use is in November I go to Dollarama I buy a box and I, like it's just full of scarves and gloves and hats and things like that and it goes yep. in the back of my car and then by the spring, there's one mismatched glove <laughs> left, maybe a scarf that wasn't even in there at the beginning of the year. All that sort of stuff. That's that's one way we get around that. Yeah, get around I, this. I just started doing that. It may have been this past winter or the winter before um, where we had to just stock up because I just was losing my mind. Awesome. We are going to come back from a break in just a second. Do you want to give us give us the phone number? Because we're going to take calls a little bit later. Yeah, so the phone number is 416-640-0200. Or you can hit us up on social media. I'm at at Lisa.Durante. You can DM me there. Awesome. We are listening to Parents Canada Radio on News Talk Saga 960. <laughs> Okay, and so we're back, Jason, and we're going to be talking to a social media expert. His name is Paul Davis, and he is quite impressive. Uh, He has over 27 years of IT knowledge and expertise. And in just the last six years, he's spoken to more than 500,000 students from grades four all the way through to high school. And it's about everything, about social media, online safety, cyberbullying, and so much more. So welcome, Paul. We'd love to hear from you. Good morning. How how is how is your morning this morning? So far, so good. Great. Yeah. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about the work that you're doing. Um, you know, t- tell us more about the the talks and all of that. Sure. Uh, my days at school are typically speaking to students during the day and then um, their parents in the evening. So mm-hmm. during the day, there's a presentation geared towards grade four, fives, and sixes, which is about fifty minutes plus Q and A, and then. My favorite version of the presentation, the grade 7, 8, or grade 7, 8, 9 presentation, which is much more intense uh, at their age level. Everything that they do online, we talk about. And in the evening, I get to come back and I get to speak to parents for 90 minutes, again, plus Q&A, more from a parenting perspective. So some of what the kids heard, but a whole lot more. And the reason they're all divided is because parents need to understand their approach in dealing with the technology they've empowered their children with. Grade 4, 5, and 6 are given some very, very specific specific deliveries, which is, number one, you are far too young to be on social media. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your parents were thinking and putting you on there. Get off social media. You're not 13. You're not allowed to be on it. Let's talk. You want to be safe? Let's talk about following and respecting rules and all the terms of service that you have to be a certain age. I do not promote teaching someone how to use something safely because they're on it anyways. This is the way the world is conforming and the reason kids are getting hurt. So they're given directives. Stay off of certain platforms. 
and then they're encouraged where they should be, which is they should be coding, developing websites, downloading educational apps, getting into robotics. Like I inspire them to be in the right part of the internet, not the bad part. Mm-hmm. The grade seven, eight, you know, most of them are getting on social media and the eights definitely are on it. So we talk about the ones most relevant to their lives, which happen to be Snapchat and Instagram. We touch on a little bit in terms of Facebook and Twitter because eventually they will come to it. But we talk about those risks along with how technology works, how phones are tracked, how pictures are made. Um, we talk about sexting, child pornography, and basically things that are impacting a lot of high school kids. We talk about privacy, we talk about passwords, and at the end of the presentation, which is 60 minutes, intense, fast-paced, they're left with a lot of knowledge. And what I love about the presentation is that it's all facts. There's no beliefs, there's no threats, there's no fear-mongering, it's all facts. And if you go home and you process the facts, hey, life online becomes much better. Now, if you mm-hmm. go home and listen, but you ignore the facts, this is where life can become a little challenging. Okay. Um, yeah, just to go back. So you were saying that 13. So is that is that what social media policies say, that you know children under 13 shouldn't be on those platforms? Absolutely. It, it, listen, for example, on Instagram, it states it is perfectly legible grade five English. You will not use Instagram unless you're 13 years of age. Snapchat. You must be 13. Facebook, you need to lie about your age to actually get in because if you're 11 and you open up an account, you have to lie about your age mm-hmm. in order to get an account. Okay. They all state 13 years of age. Paul, oh. you, you started by, or you mentioned this idea that you, you deal with this from a fact based perspective. So, you know, parents, we see a whole bunch and we, we actually inject our own kind of editorial sense of fear of things. What are the facts? What are the things that parents should know about social media screen time in terms of, you know, building the strategies to help make their kids as successful as possible? Well, I'll open in the question that we could talk about uh, for the next 30 minutes. Listen, I go by certain rules uh, in terms of online safety. Rule number one, no technology in a child's bedroom. Computers, iPods, iPads, tablets don't belong in a child's bedroom at home. Your child has a gift. It's called curiosity. Curiosity in their bedroom by themselves connected to the internet is a recipe for danger. In every cyber guy I've met in my life with children, no tech in the bedroom. You just don't allow it in there and allow their curiosity to take over. Rule number two, when it comes to screen time, there's no definitive answer. Every study is inconclusive. So I remember when I was on breakfast television, this is Paul, what's the answer to screen time? I said basically this. I subscribe to one study that talks about, you know, 30 minutes before bed, get your kids off the screen so it helps them with their sleep patterns. Now, mm-hmm. overnight, there will never be another screen in their bedroom, meaning they're not going to make poor choices at 2 o'clock in the morning underneath their sheets on Snapchat. You're going to give them a full eight hours of sleep, which also means they function better in school the next day. Um, well, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there are no devices at the table. You're going to respect your children. You're going to respect each other. You're going to engage them in conversation, and you're going to teach them the discipline of respect and of disconnecting. So focus on your kids. Talk to them. They're actually asking for it in roundabout ways, but you see the phones are compensating for the lack of attention being given to kids by parents. So the phone and the 500 fake friends on social media is compensating for all of that lack of attention. Give the kids the attention they're looking for. Now, if you apply those simple screen time rules in terms of where it doesn't belong and your child's on their device, you know, an hour and a half, two and a half, two and a half hours a day, collectively within a TV show and playing some games, that's fine. If your child is clearly on their device seven, eight hours a day, you already know you have a problem and you don't have to believe the cyber guy. You can talk to an anxiety expert or depression expert or family therapist who will tell you, you know, business is booming in their industries because of kids on their devices all the time. And yeah, we may not have a ton of scientific evidence right now, except what I call this is the generation of the experiment, which is we're just learning what's going to happen later on. So m- minimize the screen time and life will be tremendous. I, I assure you that. Get your kids back to, to being kids. And last but not least, respect those rules. If it says 13, wait till you're 17. Why is a nine-year-old kid playing Fortnite when it clearly states you need to be 12 years of age and older? I have no idea. But parents don't even understand the game. So you know, parents will say, well, what can happen on Fortnite? Well, I don't know. You tell me. What can possibly happen with your child playing with 99 complete strangers on a game? Think about it. It makes common sense. So parents need to understand the platforms before, them up, before they put them on there. And then we have parents who come in from another position, which is, you know what? My 11-year-old is on Instagram. I'm just going to teach him to use it safely. That is the most embarrassing statement I've heard out of parents' mouths. If you can't teach an adult to use a platform safely, we cannot tell ourselves or believe that we can teach a child to use a platform safely. I mean, I remember LeBron James saying when he enters the playoffs, he removes himself off of social media because he couldn't process the hate. You know, um, last week in uh, Oakland, 
when the Raptors were playing the Golden State Warriors, the wife of the owners of the of the of the Warriors was speaking to Jay Z. In between Jay Z and the wife was Beyonce. Well, because of that conversation, Beyonce had this look on her face, and Beyonce's followers thought she was really upset about the conversation. So the wife of the billionaire owner got death threats on Instagram, and she had to shut her account down. So if you know, if we as adults can't process it. I think it's we're in denial to say that kids can actually figure this out. That's why there's a time and a place. And I always say, respect those rules. Let your kid be a kid. Let them go to the great side of the internet, which is what I spoke, spoke about earlier. Life is great, but you do not have to thrust them on social media at 10 years old. Give them a thousand dollar phone. Leave them in their bedroom by themselves. That's the recipe for danger. Okay. You, you, you talk about this idea of the positive side of this because you know. So often, whenever I hear about social media, people immediately go into the negative, 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 negative. So, so help me unpack that. What is the positive side of social media? Where can kids not just be afraid or get away from their screens and things like that? What's something that's good that could happen? Well, when I made reference to the positive, it actually meant being away from social media at a young age. So if you're going to ask me, give me a positive for an 11 year old to be there, there is none. But I'm not really asking life. for an 11 year old. I'm just asking in general. For an 11 year old being on a platform, they're not allowed to be on. Sure. Where the, the number one way they get hurt is um, through social media at that age. The positives are understanding that there's another world to you, which is learning how to code. So develop the next great app. Go and create the next great game. You want to get into robotics? It's going to be a massive industry later on in life. Learn to code so you can understand how robotics works. If you do want to get online, I encourage you with mm-hmm. your parents, open up your very own website. It's called a blog. You don't have to, you can be any age to open up your own website, but the best part is you're going to do with your parents. And what a blog does is that establishes your positive visual footprint. So if you are a baker, if you're an artist, if you're a musician, if you're an athlete, whatever you do, you can talk about it without posting any personal information. No one's going to leave comments. No one's going to cyber bully you on it. You have your own website. It'll get entrenched in a Google search. And in 10 years from now, when someone looks you up because of your expertise, it's amazing how that will come to the top of a search engine because you've had it for a long time and you're going to do this with your parents, meaning they're going to prove what you put in this website. And when your friends want to keep up with you, they go to your very own website to see, hey, what's Paul up to today? Let's type in Paul's website name and see what he's up to, what he's talking about, where he's going, what he's doing, because that's my business. So that's the positive. Now, if you want to talk to me as a 14-year-old on social media with Mm -hmm. real human friends, I love it. I think it's awesome. Make sure your account is private. Make sure you don't give away real-time information. Make sure you stop posting your vacation plans and where you're going, who you're going with, how long you will be there, etc. As a communication tool, look, my daughters are both on Snapchat. Um, they use it as a communication tool, but you know the rules have been very firm because I personally, I dislike the company because of the lie that they've issued, which is images delete, and I bust that myth every day I speak to grade sevens and older. But so long as they understand that they're communicating with real human friends, I'm not going to be against the platform, but if they're going to start accepting people that they don't know and using this thing called the Snap Map, which gives away a real-time location to within 30 feet of where they are, I'm a concern. So mm-hmm. all the platforms I am not against. When you're the right age, privacy, real human contacts, stop conveying real-time information. That's amazing. Yeah, I that does it. sound I good. I spend hours just talking about that. Yeah. Unfortunately, we fall into traps of too much trust, simplicity in terms of passwords, accepting too many people in our lives. So that's why I have to talk about, so the way I define my, my day is you've got to talk about the dark side before you can talk about how good the other side can be. Sure. If you don't mm-hmm. define that, too many people fall into the trap mm-hmm. of the dark side and then they beg and ask for help. I yeah. think that's a, a great way to conclude this. You know, I'm, Like you said, we could probably spend half a day talking about this, but I think that this powerful side of understand what could go wrong before you start to talk about what could go right. I think that's a great thing. Paul, I, I want to say, where can we learn more from you? Uh, for parents, you can visit my Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Paul Davis Tips, T-I-P-S. And if they want to find out my calendar of what schools I'll be speaking at, and if they want to attend my presentation, my website is socialnetworkingsafety.net, socialnetworkingsafety.net. Awesome. Paul Davis, he's a social media expert who really does educate kids from grade six on up all the way to the parents on how we can navigate this. We are going to go to break, but we want to hear from you. We want to hear about what you're hearing, what your experience is with social media, and maybe what advice you've got for other parents. So we want you to call us, 416-640-0200. You are listening to Parents Canada Radio on News Talk Saga 960.
Welcome back to Parents Canada Talk Radio. I'm Jason Thompson. I'm here with Lisa Durante. We just spent the entire break in absolute abject fear over social media. <laughs> I mean, we learned a whole lot from Paul. That was a lot to download. You know, it, yeah. it's it's funny. I, I I think a little bit about how how. I approach social media as a dad. Mm -hmm. How do you approach social media in your house? Um, well, my kids are nine and seven, and um, you know, I think it's now Paul approved that they are not on social media just yet. <laughs> um, uh, and and I'm not at all interested in then getting on social media at any point right now. Like that's just not in my uh, thinking. Where, I, but I am teaching them about the computer and and being online and being able to do research. Um, and they do text as well, um, and they love the texting. But social media for them is just non-existent. They do know it exists, um, and I am quite active on Instagram, especially. And I have made a very conscious choice not to put my kids out up there. Um, First, it was because I just they're people and now you kind of know what they look like as babies. They'll change and morph and all of that. But as nine and seven year olds, that's pretty much what they're going to look like, just a little bit more mature <laughs> as they get older. Um, and so I felt that, you know, I shouldn't make that decision for them to put them on my Instagram feed. It's interesting thing hearing from parents who are starting to have that mindset around the kids are growing up in this social media world. They have an opinion on this. Mm -hmm. And when is it appropriate, not appropriate to share their stories? That's yeah. a really interesting way to approach that. Yeah. And it was a couple of years ago when, so I, I have two Instagram accounts. One is my business account at Lisa, Lisa Durante, And then I have a personal one. And on my personal one, I do put my kids and that is just for family members. But on my public site, um, they're, they're just not there. And there was one time where my daughter asked me, my older one, it was a couple of years ago, where she was like, can you just not put that picture out there? Because there were times where family members would come to her and talk about something I posted that she didn't know was out there. Um, and so she felt like her privacy was being violated. So um, now I ask can I, you know, can I put this picture up? Can I tell them about this? Or if some, they said something funny, because I treat my personal Instagram as if it's an album. Um, it's a memory, you know, like either they went to their piano recital or they did their dance um, or they, we had a special birthday. Um, but now they're they're starting to to ask questions and, and say, you know, can you not do that? And so I have to respect that. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good insight. I know that about a year ago on Facebook, I started posting privately just for myself. So because I, I treat Facebook like a bit of a diary and I don't need to share every single thing mm -hmm. that my kids are doing all the time. Paul mentioned something that I thought was great, which is that idea of if you're going on vacation, don't start posting it everywhere because that that's yeah. just basically a red flag. And it, it's funny because I'm mentioning that the last year that we, we, we went on a road trip, I posted all the photos at the end of the vacation mm -hmm. after when we were when we were back home and alarming the uh alarm systems overall. We, we want to hear from you as parents. If you've got any insights or any thoughts, our number is 416-640-0200. We would love to hear about your experience with social media, what's good, what's bad, and what's ugly. You know, Lisa, <laughs> like you, I've got kids who are, are very curious around not just social media, but screen time. And, and it really does... It is absolutely that that challenge. You know, Paul mentioned the idea of of coding. There's there's stuff beyond coding. You know, creating video, understanding how to edit. You know, I'm a creative professional, so teaching them mm -hmm. from a writing perspective. My son, I my son is off to university. He's interested uh, in nanotechnology, and you know, he needs to start thinking about what his career could look like. And I thought, what's a way that I could use technology to enable that? I I created a Flipboard magazine. If you don't know Flipboard, it, no. it's a social media platform that aggregates. News feed. So you go on, you can kind of click all sorts of interesting news, and then it creates a custom magazine. So over the weekend, I created a custom nanotech magazine. It took me 15 minutes and said, you know, here's exposure. Here's good things that are happening in industry, bad things. But just to start kind of wetting his whistle as he gets ready to go off to university. And I've done that mm -hmm. professionally as well for some of my clients. I find that that is a, a good use. And again, as I'm going to refer back to Paul, is my son's 17. He's not 11. I think that the, the really interesting thing that I heard from him was that idea from that 9 to 11 range where they're super, super interested in what's happening in that social media. And of course, you're going to hear from friends who are on social media and things like that, that that's where you really, really have to be super, super diligent, I think, mm -hmm. around that sort of stuff. Yeah, well, we, we spoke a lot about um, with Paul about kids being on social media. But, you know, a lot of us, especially those with younger kids, were the ones, the parents are the ones who are on social media. And, um, you know, I know that I have been quite addicted to my phone. Um, I, I've kind of broken the cycle. Uh, I spent a lot of time last fall trying to 
you know, monitoring my screen time. I had like an app that would tell me how much time I was on and which apps I was on. Um, and um, and then I got this note from my daughter. My, my daughters like to give me parenting feedback through notes. Um, yeah, they, they usually write me a letter and then they'll stick it under my pillow. So I can't even read it when they're awake. Um, and so I have to read it right before bed. And so one of the letters was from my youngest. Um, and so this was last year. She was about six. And so... You know, it's in her more phonetic writing. Um, And it was very much that I was on my phone too much. And um, and so after that, we had a really long conversation. And she now has like if we have family movie night on Friday nights is usually when we do that. She'll she has this little Easter basket that she's like, okay, everyone's phones. And she collects my husband's phone and and mine. um, And then she puts it right by her so that no one can get to it um, because she just wants us to be present. Even though we're watching television, she just wants us to be present. Um, yeah, so that that's just something I think all of us are struggling with because they are so addictive. Um, it, it's an interesting thing. Like, I'm thinking about watching the Raptors games. I tend to second screen. I tend to go, I mm-hmm. have a group chat that I we chat with of what's happening in the game, or I'll, I'll check on Reddit to see what all the haters are talking about there and how, how angry they are with Nick Nurse over calling a bad timeout. I'm not bitter at all, but the <laughs> I think that's interesting. And that idea of, you know, the data backs it up. You know, the number one thing that I've been told as a parent that you can do if you want to affect your children in the most positive way possible is modeling. Mm. They are exposed to you so frequently every single day. What you do and what you say, you're going to hear and see directly from those kids going forward. So if they see you on the phone a lot, they're going to think that that is what the culture is like. Yeah. And I, I, you know, even just coming out of this conversation, I was thinking this morning as we were coming in and I think, you know, I don't use social media a lot in front of my kids. And then I thought, but when you go to a restaurant, it's typically when we sit down at the restaurant and waiting for the drink order, you know, I'm checking, <laughs> I'm checking my email and all that. And, you know, this is maybe the better time to be engaged with the kids as opposed to, because then they learn that and think, well, you know what, I can do that. And of course that, creates the wedge that you can move forward yeah. with. Yeah, that, that just reminds me about the modeling. Um, I read an article just, you know, in prep for this show on parentscanada.com. And it was um, it was about how just even when you're in the car, if you're the passenger, you know, when you're driving, you should not be touching your phone at all. But if you're the passenger and oftentimes we'll like, you know, be in the car, all four of us going somewhere, um, I'm many times on my phone. And so one of the tips was when you're in the car, don't even touch your phone because you're modeling that it's okay to be on your phone in the car, which then your child may equate to when they start driving later on, that it's okay to touch your phone while you're driving. Um, and so just that, that that's that modeling. Um, that's something that I, I was able to learn and uh, maybe take forward. The <laughs> kids in, in my car, what it is, is they are in control of the playlist. So I've got, you know, one kid who's a huge classic rock person. Mm-hmm. I've got another one who is all into musicals right now. And then I have an eight year old who is really, really into Perry Grip. So I never get to play my own music. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you're looking at is. Perry Grip is this fantastic. If you've got kids, this is a safe, wonderful musician who does kind of riffs on, you know, classic things like rap and dance and that sort of stuff, but by using like the craziest, craziest thing like Neon mm-hmm. Pegasus and stuff like that. A lot of fun. And as a parent, because, you know, you listen to something with your small children over and over and over again, you're just like, no more, please. I'm tearing yeah. my hair out. <laughs> this stuff's good stuff. I love Is the pairing grip. Absolutely positively. But that's the way that, that we use the phone in the car. Definitely not texting and things like that, but but definitely over mm-hmm. the music. The, music. And the, pod- the other one is yeah. podcasts. I really, you know, the one thing I really wanted my kids to start getting into was podcasts. Mm-hmm. So I started listening to what they're interested in and then they they started, they really love like 99% cent, ninety nine percent Invisible and things like that, which are like science-based podcasts oh, with great cool. storytelling and, and things like that. Yeah, we've listened to a couple of podcasts. Um, we're huge Harry Potter fans. So there, there's a couple of podcasts out there that kids actually um, are the ones who are leading the conversation. And so those are just fun. Um, yeah, so that's been their little foray into it. We talked about that as well for here is, you know, this shouldn't just be the parents talking about things. Kids have an uh, opinion and insight and that, that we think is important as well. Again, our number, if you've got some thoughts or insights, 416-640-0200. We'd love to hear from you. We're going to be here every week to be able to talk about some of these great things. We'd love to hear about some of the topics you'd love to talk about. And we'd love to hear about how you're using social media with your kids. Again, maybe below the age of 11, you're keeping them away from social media, but you're teaching them how to be responsible with that content. It's it's funny. I I just approached um, my daughter, my 13-year-old. She's about to be 14. And I asked her if 
she would want to actually manage my professional social media feeds over the summer. I'm sure Paul's head's exploding somewhere <laughs> over the summer to be able to actually tweet out some of the and materials that one of my businesses actually runs. So she's oh, cool. she's thinking that over right now. Mm-hmm. All right, so we are coming to the end of this segment, so we're going to go to a break. Lisa, do you want to give us? Do you want to give us the wrap and the phone number and all that good stuff? Yeah. So again, you can reach us at four one six six four zero zero two hundred. You can hit me always on uh, Instagram DM uh, Lisa dot um, Yeah, we'd love to hear from you, and we'll be back. <laughs> Hey, you're back, and it's Parents Canada. Uh, you're with Lisa Durante and... Jason Thompson. Yeah, and so we were talking about parenting in the age of social media today, and so we had Paul Davis with us, and, you know, it, it, there were times where, you know, my, my mouth kind of fell open. I was a little shocked at what he was saying, um, but but it was, it was, like he said, it was the truth. It was based in fact, um, and sometimes we need to be sure that we're listening to that, and we're hearing that, and we're digesting it, and figuring out how do we then make the right decisions for our family because there is no one right decision. Um, he gave his recommendations on how to stay safe, safe online, um, but it very much is personal and it's how do you kind of internalize that and figure out what is right for your kid and for your family and for your situation. Um, yeah, so right now, like I said, my kids are not on social. I think I'm going to keep it that way for a little while. Um, I just, I'm just not sure about it yet and and I don't think they're ready for it and, and they have really no no interest at this point. And that's a, that's a good thing. Like, I, I think Paul brought extremely good clarity to, you know, listen, one, there's a time and a place for kids to be on social media. And it's not something you're it's, it's like holding back the dam. So you have to find that that right time, which is probably, you know, once the terms of service kick in, you know, the terms of service on things like uh, Instagram and Facebook are 12 and 13 and things like that. So you know, there really is no appropriate reason for you to be there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I also really like the idea of giving strategies going forward that there are definitely positive places with coding, you know, understanding how to be more creative, those sorts of things as you get older. One of the things he talked about was Fortnite, which, you know, I'm sure a lot of parents are experiencing right yeah. now this this world. And, and it really brings up some thinking around gaming. It, that's something that happens a lot, a lot in my house is this idea of gaming and how we can move forward and understand. But before we get to gaming, understand we have an actual caller. So why don't we why don't we start here with our first first call, Lisa? Yay! Hello. Welcome. Hi. Hi. What is your name? Hi, my name is Lynn. And where are you calling from? I'm calling from Toronto. Oh, great. So so let, let us hear. What, what are your thoughts on parenting in the age of social media? Well, I was listening to uh, your speaker, Paul. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we, he kind of very set the tone. Where, you know, your kids should not be on social media yeah. um, under the age of, what, 13 or 13, 14. 13, yeah. Um, I've got an 11-year-old who is really starting to dabble into Instagram. And I feel like, how do, how do you backstep now? Like if, uh, you know, my, my 14-year-old is, is very involved with social media and has been for a couple of years. I monitor everything. Um, they have private accounts. But, you know, now I, I feel that you know, it is true. They should not be so involved in social media. So how, do, at this point, as a parent, do you step backwards and try to get them off? Have you had any conversations with why they want to be on Instagram in the first place? Not really. I mean, my daughter is very much about um, showing her photography. So I've always supported her Instagram because she's, she's done it so well. She's not posting selfies. She's not doing any of those things that I dread. Um, but my son, is, I feel, may go the different route. Mm-hmm. And he's only 11. So I don't know. I haven't had that conversation with him because he's never really shown an interest. But now that it, it's starting to be a bit more active, uh, how do I, what, what do I do? How do I get on to that topic with him and, you know, I think it's it's a lot because their friends are so involved in it. And when their friends become involved, they think, well, everybody else is doing it, so I might as well. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I, well, I think Paul gave some really great you know, tips on how to be safe. So maybe that's part of the conversation, at least to start, is how can you be safe? You know, make sure you're not in your room, you're not uh, sharing that real-time information, um, just so that he can he can at least start to be a bit smarter about it. Um, and then, I, I, I don't know, like every parent makes their own decisions, but if they have already on it and they're not, it's not a problem. Um, maybe that's, you know, you can kind of monitor for now, um, but talk about the safety, you know, um, yeah. one of the things, you know, even hashtags, having them not use hashtags, um, making sure that it's a private account, um, just keeping them safe. Um, because at 11, you know, he's, he's two years out. Um, and instead of taking it away, because that might feel more like punishment and he doesn't know what he did wrong. Right. That, and that's the challenge, right? Once the horse is out of the gate is how do you how do you do this? I think the first thing is continue to have conversations with your kids so that they know, not only understand the boundary, you can't be here, you can't do this, why? And understand, you know, how you're going to guide them along in that journey. The private account is a good one. This is something that I did with, with my kids when they were a little younger is to say, you know, when they were curious about this, you know, being able to post photography, a, a good example is my dog has an Instagram account and my kids <laughs> manage the, so the account for the, for the dog. Set up by my kids. <laughs> and it's, it's great because it doesn't put them in any level of exposure, but we do it together. And I think that's the big thing, you know, whether it's video gaming or it's, it's social media or it's screen time, we do a lot lot of this stuff together. I, I just, the data that I've read that uh, you know, doesn't support the idea of never let your kids watch a TV or touch a screen. What it does do is say, here is how you can do this responsibly. So for back to your question is, you know, include him in that conversation. It may be that you have to put the, the horse back in the barn and say, you know what, a public Instagram account at this stage, it, I don't support that. And I know your friends are there, but I'm going to have to say that this is a non-negotiable. And here's why. And let's talk about the path for it. I, when my daughter was really interested in getting a Facebook account for a very long time. You know, she wasn't 12 yet when they had the terms of service. And we clearly said no. And here is why. And here's what your path forward looks like. And it's so, so funny. When she actually turned 12, she was less interested in it in the first place. She wanted to find places where, uh, where her friends were going. So, you know, things like Discord servers and Reddit and things like that, much even scarier things than that out there. But that might be one way is, is open up that conversation, keep that conversation going. Mm -hmm. right, right. Does that help? Yes, it does. Okay. Fortnite as well was another big one, too, where it's, uh, I can't believe you have to be that old to play Fortnite. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was an age. <laughs> Fortnite's an interesting thing because my kids never really got into the Fortnite side. They got into the Minecraft side, and we were a little more supportive of it because it's digital Lego. There's less violence, and and right. we really kind of restricted the server. So it was just friends were playing. They weren't actually in kind of the public sphere and, and things like yeah. that. But again, we, we didn't do that at 9 and 10. We waited until they were a little bit older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I think we can definitely talk about gaming, do a whole session on gaming um, because it's become so popular and so prevalent in so many people's lives. Yeah. I have a 17 year old who's begging me to build a gaming computer. Yeah. So, oh, wow. Right. <laughs> well, I can't you thank you enough do. for your call. Yeah. And uh, you are gonna, you're the way we're going to wrap for today. What an incredible first episode. Yes, you, yeah. thank you very much. They always tell well, people when you hit... You. Thank you. It was great listening. Awesome. Thank you. Tune back in next week. We're going to be talking uh, a little bit more about things like sleep habits and co-parenting and, and really what's it like to be a parent in the in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And next week, we want you to call back at Parents Canada Radio at 416-640-0200. Not useful now, but will be useful next week. So keep that in your back pocket. Thank you so much. I have been Jason Thompson. And I'm Lisa Durante. And you've been listening to Parents Canada Radio. Visit us at parentscanada.com. The News Talk Saga 960. Also streaming live on Saga960am.ca.